Native Americans, American Indians, and First Nation are all names that encompass the people who have their history been traumatized and disregarded for their beliefs and way of life. The First Nation to inhabit the United States have struggled to keep their culture, going back to when Columbus first claimed the discovery of the land where they had lived for generations. A sense of superiority over the natives on part of white men resulted in many negative encounters between the two groups. One such encounter was the American Indian Boarding School. Government organized forced removal of the native population from their homes began with the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Natives were forced to give up their land in exchange for move to Indian territory or reservations with promises of money, livestock, and tools which were never honored. The white men expected that the natives would farm, something that was new to natives usually hunted and gathered. Natives were given unsuitable farming land, and after being moved from their homeland, the effects of hunger, disease, and exhaustion were devastating. Of the 15,000 natives who were moved during two years, over 4,000 died. Ultimately, the government viewed assimilation as the only way the natives could survive alongside the white man. Young natives were sent to attend boarding schools to try and exchange their culture for a culture that was viewed as more civilized. The Indian Civilization Act of 1819 allowed government funding to support religious groups and individuals willing to live among and teach natives. This led to the opening of many mission schools which were the predecessors to government boarding schools which opened in the late 1860s. The schools quickly gained momentum because of the growing belief that the natives were in need of being civilized. Schools built on reservations were preferred by the natives, but they did not sufficiently remove the influences of tribal life, and it was preferred to build off-reservation schools. The white man hoped to produce students that were self-sufficient. This contradicted the native belief that all is to be shared with the tribe, and all work is done for the good of the tribe and not the individual. Kill the Indian and save the man was the mantra of Colonel Richard Henry Pratt. Colonel Pratt's statement meant that the natives were supposed to live like the white man and forget about the Indian way of life. The children had to give up all traditions and tribal languages to facilitate the killing of the Indian. They were also forced to celebrate traditions and holidays of the settlers which would hopefully save the man. Colonel Pratt was the headmaster of the Carlisle Indian Boarding School in Pennsylvania for 25 years. The Carlisle School was opened in 1879 and over 10,000 native students attended there. Native parents forcibly directed to send children as young as four years old to the boarding schools. Many parents were told to send their children to the schools because it was the key to their child's survival in an increasingly hostile colonial environment. Parents were threatened with imprisonment if they did not comply and many were jailed for attempting to keep their families together. Upon the native students' arrival, the negative encounters were immediate. One student, Lone Wolf, of a Blackfoot tribe remembered. Long hair was the pride of all natives. Boys, one by one, would break down and cry when they saw their braids on on the floor. All of the buckskin clothes had to go. We put on the clothes of the white man. Students were given new white names as they arrived that no longer honored their native heritage. Boys and girls were not allowed to speak their native languages and were punished harshly if they did not speak English. Although most schools were led and taught by Christian leaders, Corporal punishment, such as whipping, slapping, and withholding food were common. Students thought of the school as a prison. Many would run away from the schools, and rewards were offered for their return. A normal day included standard school subjects, such as reading and math, but as the students were deemed savages and not capable of learning, the majority of the day was spent in vocational or trade training. Boys were taught farming, blacksmithing, and carpentry, while the girls were taught cleaning, cooking, sewing, and laundry. Older students would chop wood for hours a day or other hard labor activities. Students were expected to maintain cleanliness, as discipline and routine much like the military was enforced. The government would provide transportation as it suited them to get the students to and from the schools, and families were never guaranteed when they would see each other again. Because of the language barrier, parents would not know how to send letters to their child. Some children were sent to schools up to 1,500 miles away from family. For many, weeks or months would pass without a visit home. Students were encouraged to stay over winter breaks and not chance an interruption in their education from the weather or other situation at home. The encounters at the boarding schools would continue with the regimented teaching for many years, negatively affecting thousands of Native lives. In the 1920s, some opponents began to explore the effects of boarding schools. A pivotal study, the Miriam Report, was released which stated that the most fundamental need in Indian education is a change in point of view. 
In 1934, John Collier, the U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs, saw the devastating effects of assimilation policies and reversed them with the Indian Reorganization Act. Mr. Collier used this act to protect the natives and allow them to practice their customs and religion. The act also allowed natives power and authority to write their own constitutions and govern themselves. American Indian boarding schools could no longer boast of success and instead had to admit failure. Although some natives did find growth and opportunity because of the teaching at the schools, it has since been determined that the negative impact far outweighed the benefit. From the 1930s to the 1970s, boarding school numbers dropped quickly. In 1969, a U.S. Senate subcommittee released a report, Indian Education, a National Tragedy, a National Challenge. This brought renewed attention to Native education. In 1990, the Language Revitalization Act declared a policy to preserve, protect, and promote the rights and freedoms of Native Americans to use, practice, and develop their languages. Regardless of the progress, students who attend these schools through the 1970s are still coping with the trauma of both physical and sexual abuse that plagued these schools long after the 1930s. Today, there are still a handful of boarding schools open, but funding and attendance is declining rapidly. The smudging, a native tradition. We smudge to clear the air around us. We smudge to clean our minds so we will have good thoughts. We smudge our eyes so we will only see good things. We smudge our ears so we will only hear good things. We smudge our mouths so we will only speak of good things. We smudge our whole being so we will only feel good things. For the First Nation, healing, clarity, and good thoughts are a focus of their culture. The trauma of the American Indian boarding schools for many never goes away. Today, Native communities are focusing on healing and restoring their language and culture. Schools now play a crucial role in the restoration of the First Nation with Native American immersion programs. This is just one step closer to gaining what was lost to the boarding schools that were forced upon their parents and grandparents. I recently visited a Native immersion program at Anishinaabe Academy in Minneapolis, Minnesota. During my time observing the Dakota Immersion Preschool, I noticed that their culture was all around them. The room was full of native art and words. They begin their time together by smudging to prepare them for learning. I watched as the students learn colors, days of the week, and everyday items through songs and activities. During my visit, I spoke to the school's principal, Laura Sullivan, a Ho-Chunk tribe member about the native programs at her school and her personal thoughts on the impact of the American Native boarding schools on the native community. I asked, what do you feel was the biggest negative impact on the American Native boarding schools? Mrs. Sullivan replied, It took away generations of parenting. We parent as we were parented. Because of the boarding schools, children were no longer raised by their parents. They instead were raised by those running the schools. Their children lost connection with their parents. For students who were abused by those charged with taking care of them at the schools, abuse became an acceptable form of parenting. Children also grew up unable to see themselves as successful as they were always treated as a lower class, that they would not be able to accomplish anything. My second question was, what are some ways that your school is bringing back the Native culture to this generation? She replied, at Anishinaabe, we focus on the seven grandfather teachings. They are wisdom, respect, love, bravery, humility, and truth. We encourage our students to use these teachings in everything they do. We try to expose our students to a variety of Native customs, smudging, Powwows and events like the spiritual run honoring the Dakota 38 Warriors take place throughout our school year. The Dakota Immersion Preschool is working to bring back lost language to our youngest students. Finally, I asked, what are your hopes and goals for the Native programs at your school, and where do you see your students using their new knowledge? Our hope and goal at Anishinaabe is to have kids that are fluent in their culture, that they gain a sense of belonging. Only 25% of our current students practice their culture. We hope to encourage them to begin to see themselves in their education through their history and culture. We are beginning to see young people wanting to learn about their culture before the elders are gone and they are driving the learning. These are all positive signs of healing and growth within the Native community. After my time at Anishinaabe, I felt a sense of hope and I could feel their overwhelming pride as a community rebuilding together. The American Indian boarding school movement that fought to divide conquer and eliminate the native culture was a failure by many definitions. Schools such as Anishinaabe are now helping to heal the trauma that has plagued the First Nation for generations by working to renew the rich culture and inspiring spirit of these strong people.